I walked into the barracks with my grip <laughs> and uh, there was a six foot scouser waiting for me at the top of the landing at the parachute depot. And I walked up to him, I was totally naive to the system and what was going into it. I must have been really red, uh, raw, raw to it all. And I walked up to him and I said, yeah, can you tell me, is this where 446 platoon starts, you know? And he produced a bloody great stick from behind him and whacked me straight over the head with it. I mean, I just put my hands on the wall because I saw stars and know where I was. He said, listen, you little shit. He says, you call me corporal. And you go down the end there, at the end of the corridor, your bunk's waiting. Now, I don't want to see your face. And I walked down there and there was nine other guys sat on the bed there with lumps on the wood as well. And that was my first taste of training the parachute regiment, as I say. You know, I knew it was going to be hard straight away. You can feel yourself drifting into the program that they would, would they wish. I mean, before I joined the army, I was working with geriatrics. I suppose it takes a lot of, you know, emotional and mental power to do, to, to work with elderly people like that. And then when you go to the opposite of the side of the wall, you've got to be aggressive and uncaring and prepared to kill. It's totally the opposite to what you were. Get up! The training side is that they are programming you to become one of the elite. And after about two or three weeks, everybody's got to be on the same wavelength. It's no good having a weak recruit, because it could be at that position in the battle where he is in a vital position to save everyone else. They're part of the team, the aggressive te a team of war and killing with, with an elite regiment. I was married while I was in the parachute regiment. It didn't do me no good, as far as I'm concerned. I, would have, I wouldn't have married while I was in the parachute regiment. You're away six months to nine months of the year. Coming home, the wife will be sat there. She's done your tea. You sit down, you take your boots off. She moans because you're taking your boots off and put them down by the sofa. You think, what the hell is this? I don't need this shit. But she is used to living on her own, in her own environment. You come home, you're an alien body. You don't fit in. She had a different attitude to the marriage. I was thinking, parachute regiment, the army, career, let's go for it, and for getting Brax home. We drifted apart, and we ended up getting divorced through it. There's hundreds and hundreds of other squaddies out there who know exactly what I'm talking about by the pressures of the job, because you've been programmed to think for the army and do what the army want go to war, you, you don't fight for Queen and Country, or Maggie, or whatever you want to think. You fight for yourself, and most of all, you fight for your mates. Without your mate beside you, you're nothing. We were brought up in the glories of this country, you know, and all the deeds that the military's always done, and I always envisaged that uh, you would get yourself in a final bayonet charge somewhere around the world, and do something dastardly, and uh, everyone would love you when you come home, and all this business. No one you and no one speaks to you for the best part of the year. Because to them, you're just a crow, you're just a sprog. You're just some little git and urchin off the street, you know. You're in their army, you're in their regiment, and they won't accept you till you proved yourself right. The majority of the blokes are from broken homes. They come from a really gopping area of a bad environment. 
And for them, like, it's their salvation. The army's a mother. I used to live with my grandmother, where it's a nice, safe, secure uh, home life, really. And then uh, she uh, she went away, and um, I then went back to live with my father and my stepmother, who I didn't get on too well with, because I had a stepbrother and stepsister. And it was then that I started to uh, mess around. I used to go out on raids, and I used to knock off places. When I mean that, I mean it was like bicycle shops, and I used to steal cars and push bikes and things like that. And it just escalated over a period of about 18 months, two years. I got rather good at it, actually. In fact, when I was eventually arrested under suspicion of doing these activities, they were convinced it was me and the gang, but in fact, the whole time, it was just me and the man. I was very meticulous in what I did. I never left any clues, traces, but I always managed to get away with a lot of things. So I was very good at, you know, hiding my tracks, going back for more, and always looking for an easy way in, easy way out, planning my routes, you know, and all this kind of business. And eventually, like all things you do, criminal, you get caught. And I got well and truly caught, and, uh, at that time, like, I had a lot of problems at home. I couldn't stay at home anymore, so I was put out of foster care. And fortunately enough, the people that looked after me were, were very good. And they saved me, really, from my further criminal activities. In the end, I just did it legally in the army. Hey, now, left, quick! Dodge! Left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right, right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left, When we arrived at the depot, I always remember that it was a, it was a winter time. Right? Very cold, very windy, and the square is facing the dual carriageway, a big junction in Aldershot itself, Browning Barracks. We were formed up on the square there, and we were told to drop our trousers. And uh, there, was a, there was a selection of underpants like you've never seen before in your life. Looking back, at that particular time, you never paid much attention because you were absolutely petrified what was going to happen to you. you I actually thought at one moment they were going to go around and check to see Who's been circumcised? Who hasn't? Because we're now going to circumcise people. We're just going to cut your bollocks off. It's all right, because you thought these people are maniacs. They're going to do something like that. Just, it, it, all these little things to wind you down, to abuse you, like get you naked, was always the best, you see. You're always taught. Is the way to wear a man down and make him feel really conscious of himself is to get him naked. Naked and wet is the best thing. Take you around your assault call, start bullet naked, soaking wet with a gas mask on. Very sexual, I always find that to be. Thinking back on it now, always rubber somewhere involved in it in the army. You know, <laughs> the gas mask in over the assault course, like, you know. You ever try to climb the six foot wall, start bullet naked? It doesn't do your working parts any good. It's hard exercise, you know, you've lobbed in. You've been fucking around a couple of days before the lobbying. You've lobbed in at night, you've worked all that night, all the next day, all the next day, all the next day, you've been in ambushes, advanced the contacts, day in, day out, no sleep. Hardly any food, you've been out three or four days, you come back, you're soaking wet, you hike the food, you're the throat's bite, you're pissed off, you want to fill the CO in, you want to kill the sergeant major light, and the first thing you want to do is attack some beer. And in the morning, they don't know anything about it. <laughs> well, they don't want to know about it either. You do get that, you know, old MacDonald had a farm, Zulu warriors, and dance to the flaming arseholes, and blokes do get carried away, because there's no females around, you're just performing with yourself, like, and you, you try and live your life to the full. Because you see old one, but you think of it, you think of it closely, right? Yeah, your next jump might be your last one. You know, the next exercise you do might not be your next exercise, might be for real, you see. So at all times you spend your money and you have a good time. You try and live it to the full. You know where your morals are, you look after your own mates, you try and do the best for them. Simple as that really. Everyone is very much equal, whether you're black, white, red, yellow, you are a paratrooper, and that is that. We can't have every, you know, every sort of like civilian swinging dick in your arm. So it's as simple as that. We don't want them. You don't need them. Put them in a labour force if it's really that necessary and have them working out, cleaning up, littering. Sort of like painting up vandalised uh, bus stops and things like that. They can do that. But keep away, well away from our army. The whole idea is to make sure that you can take any type of abuse physical torture, mental torture. If you can handle that, then you can handle an assault on an enemy that is five times your strength because you say so gung-ho.
Those wars worse than any other wars previous. I mean, we've gone around in a full circle now. Medieval wars were pretty hideous, and nowadays we've gone right back to that now. It's just a, like it's like a big exercise for real. And a lot of blokes get the order shot syndrome. He's like, I don't want to die here. I want to fuck off that order shot. Go down the disco, go down, go down the pub, and be a paratrooper part time and not do it for real. Unfortunately, a lot of blokes, like that, not all of them, but a few, you know. As well as I got the stage as well, I don't really have got not much to go. No, I haven't got really much to go back to anyway. I'm still relatively young, you know, 21, 22. I got no girlfriend. I'm not married. You know, I don't own any property. All I've got, the only thing I've got is my bunk, <laughs> my bunk bed in the army, like you know, and my equipment. That's me. You know. So really, at the end of the day, whether I die here or not is immaterial because when I die one of these days, I might well die here. So let's go for a little bit of glory, lads. Let's have a little bit of fun, you know. Let's do something we could never. Good chance we're never going to do that in our lives. We need soldiers that are pack horses because we landed on one side of the island to get to the other side where the Argentinians didn't expect us. I was lead scout for my platoon in my company, which was B Company 3 Power. And uh, I was like centre man of the platoon and uh, we were sort of like going straight up the mountain. And uh, I was in 5 platoon at the time, 6 platoon was going to the left, and, uh, well, sorry, 6 platoon was going to the right, and 4 platoon was going to the left, and uh, 5 platoon was going straight up the centre. It was pitch black, the mountain was like that, you know. It was a night assault, the enemy out the number was 2, 3 to 1 or whatever. We had no illumination. And it basically it was just like hand to hand, sort of like bunker to bunker, fight all the way to the top, down the other side. Myself and quite a few other blokes, you know, we just got to the stage where you're going for these crazy charges, you're going for, you know, let's, I saw this in the film, let's try this out, you know, you fire a grenade, unfortunately it bounces off the bunker roof and rolls back down to where you are, then you start, you know, messing around, like, you know, and you get incidents like that. I mean, I did spend most of the night laughing and then giggling and having a good time. We stopped and made a cup of tea at one stage. Things like this, you know, you, you take it in your stride, and I could not believe how easy and how adaptable, you know, I fitted into it. We attacked this bunker and we stopped in there and uh, we threw a few grenades in there, there was a few screamings going on. A couple of Argentinians hid underneath the pallets, they had wooden pallets inside the bunkers. And they hid underneath the pallets hoping we would find them. Like, they've got their torches out and you can see them between the pallets and they were just shot in the head. I was standing outside the bunker and we would laugh about this. And they attacked us from the flank and they fired a few rounds like one of the rounds entered my head through my helmet and uh, through my head and into the back of someone else. And that initially threw me through the air, right back down the side, we were on the side of the hill, and it threw me down the mountain. And all the blokes that are surrounding me, and friends of mine, they all come rushing down, and you're right, all right. I was going, don't take the helmet off, fuck, so I think my head's gonna fall apart. Because it felt like it, I felt like I had a you know, big bend inside my head. You know, blood was just gushing out all over your face, all running down your back, jacket soaking wet, it was running down your leg, and putties were getting like a sponge. And I thought I'd bleed to death. I fucking I'm bleeding to death. No one do anything, you know. And the, the sad thing about it, like it was my fault. I got shot myself, like I was having a good laugh at someone else being killed. But the sad thing about it was, was that when I was sitting there contemplating my lot, whether or not to take my helmet off, my head falling apart, my brain falling out, and running off down the mountain, was that one of the medics came over. He'd heard I'd been wounded. This bloke I used to go to school with. You see, he came over, rushed over to see if I was okay. He had a quick look at my head and said, right, you've got you know, a nasty scalp wound there, like, and uh, your cranium's been split. Lucky you didn't have your chin strap done. I would have broken your neck and all this business. He said, oh, you're okay, Dom. He said, I was a little bit worried about you. He then ran off in the mortar round, landed right up top and blew pieces. And I often think back, that's my only regret then, you see. I didn't really want to leave the blokes, you know. I didn't really want to leave the company of men that you keep. I didn't really want to leave them, you know, whether they're wounded or in one piece. I didn't want to leave it. I didn't 
you want to leave the Sark Major, like, you know, and you put it like that. It's a bloke you spend most of your time trying to get away from. You, you felt, you know, it's my father, like, it's my, these are my brothers, these are my, my kith and kin. Thirteen weeks leave, you see, which is like a, that's a long time. I had vitamin deficiency, like, and I had a few burns on my face and that, and uh, basically a bit of home cooking and a bit of decent fresh air, and I was well away, like, and I was getting bored. I was just, just like really anticipating coming back to a sort of like, complete unit. You know, you've got the nucleus still there, the blood smell at the foot. Coming to front! The new CO came in because he hadn't been in the Falklands, he spent most of his time slagging you off. And other NCO started turning up just because you like being in the Falklands, you would do it this way, not that way, you know, all his business. I mean, I'm not into marching around squares and dressing up nicely, which all of a sudden came into being after the Falklands campaign. I felt that was, uh, the army, not the parachute regiment, had really fucked us up. You say, look, I can earn twice as much more money outside the army now. Have a much better time, you know. You can only calm down a little bit, maybe settle down, maybe do the worst thing and get married, you know. <laughs> but that only happens for a couple of months, then you realise you might have made a mistake. Because <laughs> you think about it every day, you see, you can't keep it out of your mind, you know. And that's like, I suppose, even like, would have been a few years ago, you know and everyone can leave their doors open. It's the same kind of feeling, though. It's nice. You feel safe and secure. You do miss it. I didn't think I'd actually have to kill anyone. I think right up to the final moment, I thought, no idiot's going to actually go through with this. There's no way. I mean, by the time we got there, two pair had actually gone through their escapade at Goose Green. And we were about to march on Mount Longdon. And we're looking at the objective and I'm thinking, there's no way I'm going to have to kill anyone. It's not going to happen. But when you get the Padre, who's a brilliant guy, he's a real good guy, he was coming around saying, listen, let's talk fact here. Where do you want to be buried? <laughs> you say, well, home. Put me down for home. There's no way I'm standing this shit hole. I thought, Hang on, this is for real. This is no shit no more. We're going for it. And the arsehole tightened up, the gut turned over, and the, ex the extent of nerves that went through me were far beyond my first parachute jump with the training. We're talking the ultimate adrenaline that is going through you. You're like on a high. You're on a different wavelength. Killing was there in my face, and I knew I had to accept it. I've been programmed for it for the last six years at that particular time. So what I've been trained for, all the aggression, everything I'd done between the Italian between there and them was going to have to take place. They put us in a position where we had to win. When I went through this first light and we run through B Company's lines and I saw the Sergeant Major of B Company stood there, his face remains with me today because our company was pretty well decimated at that time and you see guys lying there with arms hanging off, half their face shot away, you know, they're shot, they're shot the smithereens, they're screaming and they're moaning. It's, there's nothing you can get, prepare yourself for that. That is the part I think that changed me as a person as I run through that position there to, to reinforce B Company after the A Company had actually finished their assault on the left and we got through there and seeing the mess of what people can do to each other it just blew my brains to a degree. I mean, a lot of us will say, well, it didn't affect me, no bullshit, you know. But I think if we all look down deep down and see what happens to your own. I wasn't worried about the Argentines, not at all. I was worried about my own mates, my own guys. That's what I've been through all my training stick together, muckers, you know, all that.
when you see your own guys blown away, killed, wounded, no way, that's shit, no way. On the next day, they, um, I can remember sitting there having a brew with a couple of lads. It was just after a stand down from expected counter attack. And <clears throat> all of a sudden, I just, we didn't even hear it. It just went whack. It was a fucking great bang. And I was on the ground. I mean, I must have got down at the right time. The shit just went everywhere. And I stood up and I knew three of the lads were down, the, down just below us from my position. And I run down there and they were just sat there in a daze looking straight ahead. And they were all looking at me like I was a village idiot. So I was screaming and saying, fuck sake, why don't you tell me you're okay? Because the shell had landed to them a lot closer than me. And then she looked at me and grinned, and I could see they were in shell shock, whatever. But I just had to laugh with the humour of it, because we were all okay. I got back to the position, I just sat there, and I was turned to the mate Steve Wake. And I turned to him and I said, it didn't sound like artillery, you know, that sounded like there was another one coming. And this one just crashed even louder. And we, we got up. And all I could hear was screaming. And I looked down the hill and I could see one of the lads just laying there. And there was smoke coming out of his smock. And Denz, Denz all his name. He's a Welsh lad, brilliant guy, one of the Italian characters. Couldn't, couldn't be a better guy. And he was just laying there screaming. I just dropped everything and I went straight down to him, in respect of another shell coming in. Because it was one of the lads, he had to get down there. And I got down there and I was oh God. His, his leg, you know, and I, there was a nine squadron, Jonah, he was with me. And we were trying to get Dental not to look at us. And Jonah said to me, look, see to the other guy, see to the other guy. And I looked, looked to my right and there was another lad laying there. I didn't want to say his name, for family reasons, obviously. But he was just laying there. And we'd always been said, the quiet ones are the worst ones. I mean, Dental was in a mess, but he, he was going to survive. We knew that straight away. The other guy worried me, and I, I crawled up beside him, and I, I got my knife out, and I was trying to get his quilted trousers off and get his smock open up, because we couldn't see any, anything hanging off. There was no, he had all his limbs and everything, he, he was okay. And I was really trying to get his wounds, and I just couldn't get his wounds, and I was, I was, I was crying with it, with the frustration of trying to get to him. And the doctor, the army medic, skidded him aside, and got his massive great pair of scissors, straight down and his legs were just a mass of lacerations from the, the shrapnel. And he said to me, look, just, just get your bandages out and tighten around the lacerations as much as you can. And while I was doing this, the, the company clerk, Clive, was actually holding his head, talking to him. And he was just looking blank. He was pale. And, oh God, I, there's no way we can sort of relive something like that again. The doctor was, do the best as he could. There was three of us working on him at that time. I was beginning to get in the way because the frustration of it. So I, I got up beside him and I was saying, listen, hang on in there. And he, and he was looking at me, big wide eyes. I always remember his big wide eyes. And he was looking at me and I was saying, look, hang in there for fuck's sake, don't go. Just keep there. That's it. I think it's going to be all right. And he was hanging in there and his, and his face just slipped. It just slipped. I could see him going and it, watching him die like that. It was, that pissed me off something chronic. What a waste. There's nothing you could do, nothing the medics could do or anything. It just died. But, uh, Denzel's all right. Great. We see him on Urban Forces weekend. That's what it's all about. He's still there, still smiling. He's, he's a success. But you think, could I have done this? Could I have done this? You think over and over again, could, you know, you sort of go through. Did I make a mistake? I didn't make any mistakes. He was going to die. It just happened to be at the wrong spot at the wrong time. There's nothing you can do around it. But watching someone slip away from you. I mean, look, just his last glimpse looking at me was sort of half a smile. What was he thinking? Did he know he was going? You don't know. Shitty experience. Shitty. Real shitty. Nothing that can army can prepare you for that. No amount of training will prepare you to watch guys die in front of you. No matter how frustrating it is. I cried for a long time over that inside. Lots of nightmares and all. 
and the wife didn't understand when I'm going. She thought it was a pain in the ass waking up with sweat and, you know, sit on the other bed at two o'clock in the morning. So I'm smack with you again, you know. So we're living it. Still living it today. I now know what my granddad went through. And all the lads that fought in the Second World War and every other war. About three or four hours after this incident, myself and a friend of mine, Kev Connery, were actually linked in, basically. I mean, it's just the spools of war. These are what it comes down to. The spools of war are things that you, you nick what you can, and that's what it was about, you know. I mean, a lot of us had Argentine weapons because we felt short-range automatic weapons a lot better than the SLR. Thank God they had the same caliber because we were running out of ammunition as well. And we come across an Argentine that had been missed by our search parties and he was laying there and he was pretty badly shot up and he was laying there and he was in shit state, I mean he was in shit state and three or four bullet holes all over him and he was... Beside him was an Argentine who was okay, they'd been hiding for some time and they just looked, looked at us when we come across him and the, the thick guy just stood up and he was saying look, with his hands up and I thought, bastards, blow them away. Blow them away, no one's going to know, you know. And the mate was saying, well, what should we do? Should we kill him or should we just carry on looting? And I looked at this guy laying there and I thought, blow him away. And I actually raised my rifle and I pointed straight at his head. And the Argentine just looked at me and he just dropped his head. He fully expected to go. And I thought, no, this ain't, there's no need for it anymore, you know. Obviously, if we've got to advance into Stanley and do more killing, we'll do it. But this particular time, something came over me. It wasn't worth killing him. Always, mate. It just wasn't worth it. And Kev says, well, all right, we'll, we'll see to him, right? And I put the rifle down and I started to act accordingly to what is required. I, saw, I often sit, think, should I have killed him for my own satisfaction? Release the, release the tension that's still in with you, Vince. Because, you, 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 you know, I mean, I've still got tension now. And I think, I should have blown him away and felt satisfied about it. And then I think, well, it's not. I mean, I know we're humans and ants are the only two species on this planet that are programmed to kill each other. But, I don't know. I didn't kill him. why a lot of the lads left after the war was they've been blooded basically they'd experienced it they'd had a taste of it they had been trained to do exactly what we went down there to do what was the point of carrying on